is a guess, but I think Trump is right now terrified that his property manager, Carlos de Oliveira, is about to flip. Trump freaked out again last night on social media about Jack Smith and the documents and Hillary emails and Biden documents and the special counsel covering the Biden documents review and without provocation from any known developments. And the last time he did stuff like that, I told you something is going on at the grand jury, but I'll be damned if I know what. And hours later, there was a superseding indictment on the documents. So with that context, let me say this again. Something is going on at the grand jury because Trump may not have many human traits, but he is really good on exhibiting cause and effect. And this freakout has to have something to do with either or both of these developments. At 10.30 this morning at the James Lawrence King Federal Justice Building in Miami, courtroom five, before Magistrate Judge Edwin G. Torres, we were to see present himself for his first appearance. Who else but Trump's newest co-defendant, his Mar-a-Lago property manager and former valet, Carlos de Oliveira, the guy who gave us the money quote so far of the destruction of evidence and obstruction case, quote, the boss wants the server deleted. And if the Trump freakout does not owe to that indictment hearing and the prospect that not everybody is as dumb as Walt Nauta and that a year ago Trump was not sure this de Oliveira wasn't the kind of guy who would flip then it's the fact that clearly Trump's Mar-a-Lago IT guy, Yusil Tavares, already flipped. I mean, we knew that Thursday, and I mentioned it here Friday. Employee 4 was the IT guy, and he's the one D. Oliveira went to in hopes of deleting the server, which isn't even what they were supposed to do, by the way. And the IT guy is Yusil Tavares, and if Carlos D. Oliveira was charged and Yusil Tavares was not charged, you didn't have to be Miss Cleo the Psychic to guess which one of them had flipped. You picked a fine time to leave me, you seal. But over the weekend, CNN and the Washington Post, if you had any remaining doubts, put the details together and it's clear that after Trump and Nauta were indicted in June, Jack Smith's team figured out that the IT guy, Tavares, knew more than he had told them. And they sent him a target letter and as the Post put it, in amazingly prosaic terms, quote, after Trump and Nauta were indicted in June, Tavares decided he had more he wanted to tell the authorities about his conversations with de Oliveira, unquote. You think? Quote, Tavares offered information implicating all three defendants in alleged conspiracy to cover up evidence. So... Severus flipped and damned quickly, and Trump has been worried about de Oliveira flipping for a year. And if he does flip, that would leave two of the four conspirators to destroy evidence, two guys with no political axe to grind and nothing but previous records of utter loyalty to this slug Trump. Those two guys testifying against Trump and Walt Nauta, and boy, oh boy, at that point, the pressure on Walt Nauta becomes almost unbearable, and if Nauta flips on Trump, that's the ball game if the damn case ever gets to trial. And oh, by the way, we are still waiting for the January 6th indictments, if anybody still remembers that far back to, when was that again? Last Thursday. The weekend's other news, the Washington Post report that Trump's Save America PAC was to disclose to the authorities today that it has spent $40,200,000 not on its purpose, campaigning, but on legal bills incurred by Trump and Nauta and de Oliveira, for the moment anyway, and everybody else in the legal crosshairs. That suggests that there is an ad hoc, organic, unintentional alternative to actually prosecuting Trump, just drown him in bills from attorneys. It is so bad that the New York Times says that this one pack had transferred $60 million to another Trump pack, and now it wants it back because it doesn't have any money at all. 
If you can't really drive Trump to a plea deal by burning him to the ground with legal bills, at least this serves to explain his campaign's newest catechism, wherein Trump gets up and says, I am being indicted for you. I am being indicted for you has a second unspoken sentence. I am being indicted for you, so you better help me pay for it. This also explains the targets of Trump's latest rages, Republicans in the House and Senate. At his rally in Erie, Pennsylvania, he raised the stakes of this part of the campaign, which is a campaign entirely about avenging himself or preferably having others avenge him for him. Any Republican, he said, that does not act on Democratic fraud should be immediately primaried. Well, that dovetails with the previously inexplicable Trump demand last week, I think it was, to know why Senate Republicans weren't doing anything to stop Jack Smith. This, of course, is known colloquially as blackmail, and central to the Trump mob family is internal blackmail. You either do the bidding of the godfather or you are an enemy and the omerta will be directed at you. Every authoritarian politician in every country in every century has utilized this, and it always ends the same way, from at least the French Revolution on forward. One day, one of the previously loyal minions will decide they have had too much of this, and they go rogue, and they either take the godfather out or they rat him out. If it isn't clear, what Trump wants House and Senate Republicans to do is to fabricate more investigations against Joe Biden and his family and anybody else they can think of. The rest of his rally quote was, the Republicans are very high class. You've got to get a little bit lower class. Well, he's wrong about that, obviously, but moving on. For now, Trump is still Anthony Fremont from that Make Your Skin Crawl episode of The Twilight Zone, It's a Good Life. He is the kid played by the actor Billy Moomy, who has godlike powers and has either isolated his hometown, Peaksville, Ohio, from the rest of the world, or he's just simply destroyed the rest of the world. And he can read minds and he can kill people by just thinking about it. And you have to keep happy thoughts because otherwise Anthony will get paranoid and he will wish you into the cornfield. And one of the few remaining adults in this TV play, Dan Hollis, has a birthday party and he gets drunk at it. And he blurts out that if they were all to rush Anthony at the same time, they could kill him. And of course, the rest of them are too gutless to do it. And Anthony has time to turn Dan into a jack in the box. I'm not sure which one of the Republicans who has tried to stand up to Trump over the last eight years might be Dan Hollis. Although if Trump has turned anybody into a jack in the box, that has got to be Lindsey Graham. But the one theory among the still sane Republicans has always been if they all told the truth about Trump simultaneously, all of them, they could rush him and kill his political career before he could destroy them first. They, of course, have never done this because nearly all of Trump's would-be opponents are too busy walking this imaginary tightrope which exists only in their own minds in which they can run against Trump while somehow not letting his base realize they are running against Trump so that his base will still support them after they defeat Trump. This may make sense to Nikki Haley and Vivek Ramaswamy, but it doesn't make sense to anybody who isn't an idiot. And every once in a while, there is a moment where it looks like all the Dan Hollises might just simultaneously rush at Anthony Fremont Trump after all. We're approaching another such moment, I think. Chris Christie has been beating him up for weeks. Yeah, it may be futile. It may be hypocritical. It may be eight years too late. None of these truths means it can't still be enjoyable. Asa Hutchinson again said yesterday Trump must stop attacking the justice system and the Republicans have to do something to make him stop. And then there is Will Hurd, the ex-Texas congressman who got up at the Des Moines Republican mega MAGA event over the weekend and finished his speech by telling uh, the, um, well, truth. One of the things we need in our elected leaders for them to tell the truth, even if it's unpopular. 
Donald Trump is not running for president to make America great again. Donald Trump is not running for president to represent the people that voted for him in 2016 and 2020. Donald Trump is running to stay out of prison. And if we elect, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Listen, I know the truth, the truth is hard. But if we elect Donald Trump, we are willingly giving Joe Biden four more years in the White House, and America can't handle that. God bless you, and God bless America. Mr. Hurd has not been turned into a jack-in-the-box yet. Mr. Hurd has received a donation, one American dollar, to get him to that 40,000 donor threshold in order to win a place on the GOP debate stage. He got that one dollar from me. This is a first for me, donating to a Republican, and presumably a last. Also, the last time I donated to anybody, it was apparently a surprise to my then employers that, oh, gosh, he's a liberal. So I didn't want anybody confused by my chipping in my dollar to give Will Hurd a chance to join Christian Hutchinson and rush Anthony while they still have a chance. Sadly, as apt as they are, and in some respects as fun as they are, the metaphors of rushing Trump before he can rush you are, we know all too well in Trump's case, not metaphors at all. Two new developments on that front. The Chicago Project on Security Threats has polled Americans on this statement, quote, the use of force is justified to restore Donald Trump to the presidency. The use of force is justified to restore Donald Trump to the presidency. On April 6th of this year, four and a half percent of Americans said they agreed with that. The use of force. On June 26th, that number had grown to 7%. In real terms, that is six million more Americans now who would at least approve the use of violence or the threat of it to put Trump back in power than just in April. The total is 18 million. And they are less and less afraid of asserting this in public. Sometimes it comes out unintentionally. The Right Side Broadcasting Network, the propaganda stream that makes OAN and Newsmax both look like the McNeil Lair News Hour, carried Trump's rally in Pennsylvania. And in what is nauseating but disturbingly effective pregame programming, Right Side Broadcasting basically interviewed everybody waiting to get into the rally. Hearing others openly speak hatred and violence and madness reassures the other crazies that they aren't crazy. But RSBN exceeded even those parameters. The voice of the quote interviewer you will hear is that of someone named Matthew Alvarez. I know nothing else about him except that his excuse on RSBN afterwards will be that it's very noisy outside, and he never heard what the interviewee says. How you guys doing? Good, good, good. I'm here to to guarantee Trump gets back in and get rid of the corruption that's in the White House right now. It's a disgrace. He's a just Joe Biden's a disgrace to this country. He's a disgrace, and so are all the uh, so the left and the uh, rhinos, you know, the globalists. Of them. They kill them all. Yeah. <laughs> Joe Mall. I, I agree with you on that. Ma'am, I love your uh, shirt there. I stand with Trump. What a great shirt to wear. <laughs> that's where we are. I never heard that said even though he said it twice and I agreed with it. Later, this man Alvarez said, quote, all I know is I'm here for God, for this country, for truth, for President Trump, that kind of thing. (laughs) Definitely not a proponent of that kind of thing happening, unquote. At any other moment in American media history, Matthew Alvarez's career would have ended And he would have to gain employment in any field ever again. He would have had to change his name. Now, he'll probably wind up dating Marjorie Taylor Greene. Or maybe Nancy Mace. Also of interest here as we conclude the first season of this news podcast. That's right. Tomorrow is the one-year anniversary And thus will begin season two. 
Say, what about that Supreme Court justice declaring Congress has no constitutional right to establish any rules whatsoever for his behavior, his corrupt behavior, his corrupt fundamentalist whore for sale behavior? Who does Sam Alito think he is? Anthony from the Twilight Zone? Or worse yet, Trump? That's next. This is Countdown. This is Countdown with Keith Olbermann. Postscripts to the news, some headlines, some updates, some snarks, some predictions. Dateline Washington, Taylor Taranto is trying to get out of prison. It has been long enough that you may recognize the name without remembering exactly what this guy did. He is the January 6th defendant who amplified the post in which Trump doxed President Obama. And then he went there to find the secret tunnels into Obama's house, and he live streamed himself doing so. For a week, it seemed as if the authorities were going to have to let him go because the only January 6th charges against him were misdemeanor trespassing. Two weeks ago, U.S. attorneys finally indicted Taranto on additional charges, felony counts of carrying a pistol without a license and possession of a large capacity ammunition feeding device. Now, Taranto's attorney has filed a new motion asking for his release. To quote it, he has no criminal record and is likely facing a probationary sentence even if convicted at trial. Nuts as that sounds, there is a real problem here. The probation thing may be a pipe dream of the lawyer, but the charges are not commensurate with what he was trying to do at the Obama's home. Nor, just the charges now, do the charges seem to be grounds to detain him until trial. Dateline the Supreme Court. Yeah, we got another problem here. Justice Samuel Alito turns out not only to be corrupt, he seems to have actually gone crazy. I am presuming you saw the unbelievable kiss-ass op-ed on Alito in the Wall Street Journal in which Alito railed against, well, against the fact that the rest of us have caught on to how the conservatives on the Supreme Court are theocratic prostitutes. Alito said, quote, no provision in the Constitution gives them the authority to regulate the Supreme Court, period. So this suggests Mr. Alito, the justice with the Messiah complex, has never read a key original document from the founding of our nation. In that, there is a sentence which reads as follows. In all the other cases before mentioned, the Supreme Court shall have appellate jurisdiction both as to law and fact with such exceptions and under such regulations as the Congress shall make, unquote. This little obscure document is called the Constitution of the United States of America. It's Article 3, Section 2. The only way Alito does not know this or can pretend to ignore it is if his brain does not work right. Can Congress please pass a justice crazy law? As for the corrupt part, the Wall Street Journal here, it can rival the Supreme Court on it. Uh, one of the authors of the piece is David Rivkin, who sat with Alito for four hours for this piece. He is an attorney who has, oh, looky here, a tax case to be heard next term by the Supreme Court. And Rivkin wrote to the Senate Judiciary Committee last week to insist that it has no authority over the actions of his private client, who, you know, may or may not own some of the judges, his private client, a uh, fellow name of Leonard Leo, we have to change the Supreme Court or shut it down, but fast. <laughs> This is Sports Center. Wait, check that. Not anymore. This is Countdown with Keith Olbermann. In sports, how quickly things turn in baseball. A week ago, the Chicago Cubs were trying to decide where to trade their revivified outfielder, Cody Bellinger, the 2019 National League MVP who had been paid $44.5 million to bat 203 over the next three seasons, but who has been born again this year in Chicago and was hitting 315. 
And then the Cubs ran off eight straight wins and vaulted back into the playoff race. And now they are explaining, no, we will not be trading Bellinger at the dealing deadline. But if you are interested in trading this guy over here or that guy over there, we'll make you an offer. The Cubs will not be getting 105 throwing relief pitcher Jordan Hicks going from the St. Louis Cardinals to the Toronto Blue Jays. St. Louis has also dumped reliever Chris Stratton and starter Jordan Montgomery on Texas. The trading deadline in baseball is 6 p.m. tomorrow, that is Tuesday afternoon. Faust. Meanwhile, the team that is by the numbers having the most underachieving season of all time, the 2023 New York Mets, not only traded three times Cy Young Award winner Max Scherzer to Texas for Atlanta outfielder Ronald Acuna's kid brother, but they threw in about $35 million to help cover his $43 million annual salary this year and next, and then the general manager of the team, Billy Epler, announced the Mets are not doing a rebuild or a teardown and intend to contend next year. Problem was, Scherzer's slider doesn't slide all the time anymore. He may still be good, sometimes maybe great, but he is no longer dependably anything special. And with that, the statement anyway, Epler, who was the general manager of the Los Angeles Angels when they signed a certain player from Japan, and the Mets franchise owner Steve Cohen, who is personally worth an estimated $1 billion, the two of them have kind of painted themselves into a corner. That certain player from Japan, Epler was present when the Angels signed Shohei Otani, the American League's best hitter and either its best or second best pitcher, who by definition is the most valuable player every year because he is essentially better than any other two players combined. Otani is still unsigned for next season. He is expected to remain such and to become a free agent this winter. Cohen not only has money, but his team desperately needs one, a great youngish pitcher, and two, a great youngish slugger. And Otani, who just turned 29, is both of those. Cohen and Epler and the Mets can probably survive the wrath of their fan base if they do not sign Otani because he just doesn't want to play for the Mets or in New York, but not if it turns out to be a question of money. How much will Otani get? The Orange County Register recently carefully extrapolated from basically all previous free agent deals and calculated that working from them and adding inflation, Shohei Otani is worth, or at least could get, a salary of $70 million a season. But two winters ago, Steve Cohen signed the just-traded Max Scherzer for $43 million, and last winter he signed fellow anti-Diluvian pitcher Justin Verlander for $43 million more. And if you stop and think about it, a player like Otani is actually worth more than the sum of his parts because he only takes up one spot on your roster but basically fills two, leaving you an open spot to go get somebody else who can do even more damage for you. So... Will the Mets offer Shohei Otani $90 million a year? $100 million? More? Of course, that raises one unfortunate point that no math and no metric can address. The Mets have, throughout their history, now 61 seasons, a really unfortunate history when it comes to bringing in star players from other teams, either by free agency or by trade, And not only not getting world championships out of them, but seeing them basically bottom out and turn into mediocrities. Some have worked out. Gary Carter, Keith Hernandez, Mike Piazza, Pedro Martinez. The others? Hall of Fame outfielders Willie Mays, Duke Snyder, and Richie Ashburn. No. Hall of Fame pitchers Tom Glavin and Warren Spahn. Well, they got rid of Spahn in July of the first year. Hall of Fame infielders Eddie Murray and Roberto Alomar. And Roberto Alomar is still 
hated in New York. And other players who had strong success elsewhere, like catcher James McCann, first baseman Mo Vaughn, second baseman Carlos Baerga and Robinson Cano, shortstop Mike Bordick, third baseman Joe Foy and Jim Fergosi, outfielders Jason Bay and Bobby Bonilla and Juan Samuel and Vince Coleman. And Vince Coleman one night threw lit firecrackers at Mets fans just as if it needed to be worse. And pitchers like Brett Saberhagen and Mickey Lolich and Victor Zambrano and Frank Francisco and and Max Scherzer. When they really needed him, he came up really small. And even a manager, Art Howe, who the Mets basically traded for from Oakland. So there is the horrifying thought that there is some sort of curse on players the Mets spend the money on or the player talent on to import from other teams and that maybe on behalf of baseball, perhaps on behalf of all of mankind, the Mets should not try to sign Shohei Otani. Still ahead on the all-new pre-anniversary edition of Countdown, the last episode of the first season, when the president of a news network is heartbroken because there is breaking news. I saw it and I still don't believe it. Things I promise not to tell next. First time for the daily roundup of the miscreants, morons, and Dunning-Kruger effect specimens who constitute today's worst persons in the world. The bronze, Ron DeSantis. It's a good thing his commitment to woke is working so well for his presidential campaign because it's killing his state. The Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity, the oldest historically black college fraternity in the U.S., was scheduled to hold its 2025 convention in Orlando, which is still in Florida last time I looked. It has now been canceled there thanks to the DeSantis mindless, racist, self-defenestrating insistence that American slavery really existed just to, you know, train blacksmiths using whips and branding irons on them when they messed up, but still, it was just a vocational program with whips and branding irons. The Alpha Phi Alpha Convention, which will go somewhere other than Florida, brings 4,000 to 6,000 people to its host city and $4,600,000 in estimated revenue for the host city. By the way, a Fox News poll showed that that portion of Americans who view wokeness as the top issue of today is 1%. Well done, Ron DeSantis. Ha 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 This is me laughing. The runner-up, New Jersey Congressman Christopher Smith, who will condemn untold numbers of people in Africa and around the world to contracting and perhaps dying from HIV and AIDS. For 20 years, PEPFAR, President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, has saved an estimated 25 million lives worldwide. But our Congress may not renew our support of PEPFAR because this idiot Smith from Jersey believes a conspiracy theory promulgated by the scumbags at the Heritage Foundation. Some recent PEPFAR documents include the phrase sexual and reproductive health, and the fascists believe that is code for paying for abortions. It isn't But don't tell Congressman Christopher Smith that because he believes his conspiracy theories and his fascist society rumors and instructions instead of, you know, reality. As chairman of the Congressional Global Health, Global Human Rights and International Organizations Subcommittee, Smith, whose only real taste of the real world was 45 years ago when he worked in the family sporting goods store in Rawai, is holding up the reauthorization. So this sloth gets to decide who lives and who dies. But our winner, Musk the asshole. Not only did Elon Musk install a new illuminated sign atop Twitter headquarters in San Francisco, without a permit apparently, without sufficient support to keep it from blowing over apparently, and in specific violation of his lease on the building, but his people refused to let San Francisco building inspectors even see it over the weekend. Not only did he do all that, but he unsuspended the Twitter account of the anti-Semite and lunatic Kanye West and gave Kanye West a verification badge claiming that his handle ye, yay, ye, is West's brand logo. 
Now, I'm genuinely confused. I thought the Nazi swastika was Kanye West's brand logo. Elon Musk. Gotta be brain damage. Today's worst person in the world. Just ahead, I need to correct a mistake I made here, and that in turn reminded me of yet another story from the annals of MSNBC. Talk about mistakes. This one is from 19 years ago, and it seems way less believable today than it did then, and and by the way, it didn't seem all that believable then. First time to feature another dog in need you can help, every dog has its day, to the high kill shelter at Devore, California, and Petros. And Petros got there three weeks ago with a suspicious neck injury. The injury is healed. He's great. So now they may kill him because of overcrowding. Petros is an absolutely 100% adorable lab golden retriever mix with a gigantic tail wag, a huge butt wiggle, and a big smile. And he needs either a foster or adopter in Southern California or our pledges to help a rescue defray the costs of getting him out of there in time. You can find video of Petros on my Twitter feeds. Warning, he is unbelievably cute. Your pledges and your retweets are gratefully accepted. Let's save him. Petros thanks you, and I thank you. Finally, to the number one story on the countdown and a correction. First... Friday, here in bashing Senator Tommy Tuberville about his claim that his father participated in D-Day, I said the Washington Post had found a contemporary newspaper account that said Tuberville's father had been in Europe since June 7th, 1944, when D-Day was June 5th, 1944. And of course, D-Day was June 6th, 1944. So I was wrong, and apparently so was Senator Tuberville about whether or not his father was at D-Day. And that, in turn, reminded me of a story about covering D-Day. So, to my favorite topic, me, and things I promised not to tell, and D-Day plus 60. It was June 6th, 2004, and MSNBC's new president, Rick Kaplan, needed to make a mark on the network for his new bosses, and he decided this was going to be it. On June 6, 2004, maybe the last even-numbered anniversary of D-Day where we'd have a lot of people left who were there, we'd turn the network all D-Day. June 6, 2004 basically was going to be June 6, 1944 relived. Tom Brokaw live on the beaches of Normandy and somebody there and somebody here and his main two MSNBC news anchors, me and Lester Holt, anchoring two-hour blocks devoted to the anniversary and then switching off and he came back and I would go away and then I'd come back and he would go away. Just wall to wall, I'm Rick Kaplan and I used to produce for Walter Cronkite to not only lock in his new gig at MSNBC but set himself up for his next goal, executive in charge of the Today Show or NBC Nightly News or something bigger than that little crap shack we ran at MSNBC. For my part, I was dispatched first to interview one of the surprisingly large number of soldiers and sailors and airmen who survived D-Day and went on to fame. There were actors Charles Durning and James Doohan, Scotty on Star Trek, and the author J.D. Salinger, and seaman second-class Yogi Berra. I met Yogi at his museum in New Jersey, and I swear to God he and his son demanded a friendly bribe to do the interview, and what they wanted was my copy of the 1963 Topps Yogi Berra baseball card. Seriously. That's the toughest one to find, Yogi said. We never have enough of them here. I always enjoyed Yogi, but he had more to say about his 1963 baseball card and its relative scarcity than he did about the D-Day invasion and his chief on his rocket launcher boat telling him to keep his head down or he might get to watch it fly off his neck. Anyway, the Barra interview was fine, and and it was done, and we edited like 15 very, very short answers into about two minutes of not bad narrative, 
and I had written a couple of other D-Day features, and I'd written some other scripts on Friday, and by Sunday we were all crammed into the main MSNBC conference room in Secaucus, New Jersey, everybody working a sixth day, and you would have thought this guy, Rick Kaplan, president of the network, was leading the actual invasion of Normandy, not merely a cable TV network coverage of the 60th anniversary thereof. Kaplan was waxing poetic about how important this was for us and how it would put us on the map against CNN and Fox and how we had covered all the contingencies. And that's when people's phones started vibrating and ringing. Kaplan was still enjoying the sound of his own voice as these phones gradually drowned him out when one of the producers finished whispering into his Blackberry and then said, "Uh, excuse me, Rick, we have a problem. Ronald Reagan has just died. Without a word, 20 people at that conference table rose and then froze, realizing that before they abandoned this meeting to go get on the air as quickly as possible and then to lay out what would be rolling coverage till at least midnight of Reagan's death and life and the reaction to it till further notice. We couldn't just start. We basically had to wait for the president of the network who was sitting there, Rick Kaplan, to say, OK, we'll figure out the D-Day stuff later. It's Reagan Day. Let's go. Except he didn't say that. Looking crestfallen, looking like a kid who's had his toys stolen and then broken as he watched. Rick Kaplan swept the room with his gaze. He stopped on me. Thanks. Couldn't we just, uh, couldn't we just do, uh, half an hour of Reagan and then, um, half an hour of, of, of my D-Day and, and then... Half an hour. And he trailed off. And I said, Rick, it's a two-term president. I mean, I think he was full of crap, but apparently a lot of America thinks he's some sort of icon. And and by the way, it just, it just happened like 11 minutes ago. It didn't happen 60 years ago. I, I'm sorry. He was almost literally pouting. But what about all my D-Day coverage? president of the network. And I said, well, we can run those pieces throughout the day tomorrow. They won't just disappear. We don't have to go degauss the tapes. Okay. We realized that the president of the news network was not going to be any use helping us cover the first big breaking news story of his presidency because he couldn't bear to change his plans to accommodate breaking presidential news. This was at the end of month three of the Rick Kaplan MSNBC presidency. He was already on the ropes with us. He would later be the guy who chased me around the studios because he was squeamish and I'd mentioned blood on the air and he thought I was trying to sabotage his great show with Rita Cosby. He would soon be the network president who did not know what was live on TV and what was on delay. I'll tell you that story in a minute too. However, the Rick Kaplan story starts in the men's room at MSNBC. It is February 17th, 2004, at one of those moronic corporate-speak town halls. The bosses have just introduced Rick Kaplan as the new president of the network. Kaplan speaks for an hour without interruption. He does not mention that he was the president of CNN when its 19-year streak at number one in the cable news ratings came to an abrupt end. He does, however, mention that he is six feet, seven inches tall, but he does not seem to be six feet, seven inches tall. As this nonsense ends, I rush into the men's room and find, to my amusement, Joe Scarborough, Chris Matthews, Jesse Ventura, Lester Holt, and one unoccupied urinal. As I move to occupy it, it dawns on me that Ventura, the former professional wrestler, is the shortest man in the bathroom at six feet two. All five of us are silent. Finally, Matthews says it. How in the hell can he say he's six foot seven? He's barely taller than I am, and I'm six four. Alderman, are you slightly taller than me or slightly shorter than me? How how is he 6'7"? Everybody keeps looking forward, of course, into the wall in front of us. I'm 6'3 and a half. Lester, he's your height. I saw you standing with him. You two are even. What are you, 6'5"? Lester says, "Uh uh-huh, and flushes. Scarborough chimes in. I'm just over 6'4". We're almost eye to eye. He's not 6'7". 
Finally, Ventura speaks. I've been thrown around a ring by guys who are 6'7". This guy's not 6'7". From the sink, Lester Holt now says, Have any of you known anybody our height who lies and says they are taller? Matthews again. Who lies about their height? I flush. This guy does. Gentlemen, we are in trouble here. For the presidency of Rick Kaplan at MSNBC, that might have been, sorry, I can't resist it, the high water mark. Later, on Friday, March 5th, 2004, Kaplan, who had been there three weeks, assembled the hosts and producers of the primetime shows on the network. That would have been me, Scarborough, Dan Abrams, our staffs, the New Jersey staff of Chris Matthews' show, and he told us that the next day was going to be Monday. Somebody from Scarborough's staff helpfully corrected him. Mr. Kaplan, I'm sorry, tomorrow is Saturday. Kaplan sternly explained he was now president of this network and we all sucked. And if he said today was Friday and tomorrow was Monday, then today was Friday and tomorrow was Monday. He wanted to see us react to sudden changes in our plans. We were being told we were being called into work a sixth day tomorrow for no reason. Kaplan then started yelling at us. You guys don't get it. You're all working tomorrow. Anybody who doesn't come in is fired. We're going to do the whole pro primetime lineup. Your breaking news is today's breaking news. The guilty verdict in the Martha Stewart case. Start booking your guests because tomorrow is Monday, not Saturday. Just on my staff, Saturday was supposed to be my reporter's engagement party a surprise party thrown by one of my producers for his wife's birthday, and the day another producer was closing on buying a house. I have a vague memory of what we put on the air. I have a stronger memory of the new president of MSNBC losing the staffs of all four of his primetime shows on his fifth day on the job and never, ever getting them back. Kaplan then went to a cork board on our office wall on which our show rundown was displayed. He ordered producers to move segments around, and he berated me for not having anticipated his whims. And at one point, he screamed, Stop! What the hell are you doing? And he got up, and he grabbed the push pin, which held up an index card bearing the name of a guest. You don't use green pins with yellow index cards. You use yellow pins with yellow index cards. What kind of a newsman are you? Can't imagine how this guy choked away CNN's monopoly on cable news ratings. I was reminded recently that later on, December 8th, 2005, 17 years ago tomorrow, he did one of the most unintentionally funniest things I have ever witnessed. A plane slid off the runway at Midway Airport in Chicago. Nothing funny about that, obviously. But Kaplan called into our control room demanding we change something about our live coverage that he didn't like. We promptly made the change. He was right. Five minutes later, he called in and started swearing at one of our producers. I told you to change that. F you. You're fired. And the producer said, we changed it five minutes ago when you called in. Silence. Rick, are you watching the network on some sort of delay? Uh, are you watching on TiVo or something? Silence again. Finally, he said, okay, good work. See you tomorrow, and hung up. He didn't know he was watching it on a delay. Kaplan was also one of these, forget the mean thing I said yesterday, God knows I have kind of guys. By Monday, he had heard people laughing at some of my on-air jokes, and his front-runner instincts took over. He called me and the producer in for a meeting. I have only one criticism of your show. The which of these stories will you be talking about thing is genius. The fifth story, the fourth story, then the third story. It's original and fresh. I hesitated. I almost said to him, yeah, this whole counting thing, we just invented that. The music is genius. The graphics are genius. You're genius. But you're missing something obvious, something genius. After each one of these stories, after you thank your guest... You should do a list of the things you didn't tell us about those stories. So, so like after the fifth story, you should say, now here are the other five things we didn't tell you about the fifth story. Get it? A full screen graphic and you telling people. And then four things for the fourth story and, and, and three for the third. I thought for a moment and I said, okay, but what happens if we make those graphics up and then a minute beforehand the guest brings up one of those things we claim we didn't tell you when he just told you? We had lost Rick Kaplan's attention by that point. Hmm? He grunted. 
For a second, I thought his eyes were pointing outwards in different directions, but he snapped himself back into this reality. Ah, could happen. You'll figure it out. Anyway, too late to do it today. Figure it out and do it tomorrow. Thanks. Uh, the producer and I had to then explain to the staff of Countdown that from now on, for every story, they had to deliberately leave out one or two or three or four or five facts or details. Something interesting enough to be made into a full screen graphic, but not interesting enough to be included in their scripts or the interviews with the guests. Suddenly, I thought a lot of people's eyes were pointing outwards in different directions. The line producer, Greg Kordick, who was in charge not of content but of timing things and making sure things like graphics got made, said matter-of-factly, this will add five hours to everybody's workday. And so it did. After the next day's show, when we listed the top five things we didn't tell you about today's fifth story and the top four things we didn't tell you about today's fourth story, etc., and we had to shorten all the scripts and shorten each interview just to make room for all of this extraneous crap, Greg, the producer, said... People here will be quitting by Thursday and dying by Monday. And I said, you're right. Plus, it ruins the interviews and it weakens the show. Don't do it tomorrow. If Kaplan yells, I'll take the heat. So now it's Wednesday. And not only don't I hear anything from Kaplan about the Tuesday show and his the top five things we didn't tell you about today's fifth story jazz. But after the Wednesday show, when we don't do it, I'm sitting there waiting for an enraged phone call because we didn't. Thursday morning at home, I'm waiting for an enraged email Thursday afternoon, I'm waiting for an enraged Kaplan in person. Nothing. He never said a word. A week passes. Nothing. A month. Two months. It's summer. Nothing. The rest of 2004 flies by. Nothing. We did it once. We never did it. Again. And then he never said anything. It is now January 2005, and he still hasn't said anything, and I'm told by Phil Griffin, my first producer in television sports, and 16 years my f- later, my first producer in television news, who has since become the vice president of MSNBC, that Kaplan wants to see us in his office. It's not a big deal, Phil says. He's in a good mood. He just wants to make us feel like we have input into his decisions. This is a what-do-you-think meeting. Now, I have to ask you to carefully picture the layout of Rick Kaplan's office at MSNBC in the year 2005. Envision a long, narrow room. Baseball's MLB network now operates there, and they have cleverly turned Kaplan's office into a wardrobe room. Perfect, since it was really just a long closet anyways. Rick Kaplan, who was six foot five but lied and said he was six foot seven, sat at the very back of this room. So you come in the front door, you turn to your right, And maybe 30, 35, 40 feet away from you, in the farthest corner, facing his computer on his desk, flush against the left-hand wall, is the president of MSNBC. A few feet into the room is where you sit. Halfway between these two points, against the right-hand wall, is where another executive can sit. So Phil Griffin sits there. I am just inside the door. He is 15 feet ahead of me to the right. Rick Kaplan is 30 feet or 40 feet ahead of me to the left. Picture this carefully. The way these chairs and desks are arranged. If you're me and Phil Griffin is looking at you, Rick Kaplan can only see the back of Phil Griffin's head and not his face. If they are both looking at you, they cannot see each other. Weird, seemingly trivial, turned out to be essential. We begin this meaningless meeting and talk about guests and graphics fonts. And Kaplan talks about how much the ratings have gone up in his year as president. And finally, I say, I do have one suggestion. I think the show is going to be very successful. And I think if we want to make any changes, we should make them now before it becomes successful. And I say, I have never heard anybody say they like the fifth story, fourth story, third story stuff. If you want to continue the name Countdown because people know it by now, uh, that's great, I guess. But the 54321 numbering is a conceit, and it's a lot of extra work for everybody, and I think we should kill it now. Kaplan is aghast. He is pale. He is not angry. He is just stunned. But you can't do that. 54321 is is part of the reasons the ratings went up. 
The, the ratings went up when I came up with the idea of, of the top five things we didn't tell you about today's top five stories. And the top four things we didn't tell you about today's number four story, etc. We can't stop that. That's why people watch my idea. Took me a split second to even remember what the hell it was he was talking about. I had forgotten the whole five things we didn't tell you, Albatross, weeks after the one show we did it, and then the staff rebelled, and I said, screw it, and I'll take the heat. And I was about to say this out loud when I suddenly realized that Phil Griffin, 15 feet away on the right, his face turned to me and thus invisible to Kaplan, 30 feet away on the left, was making his eyes as wide as possible, and Phil was looking right at me and silently mouthing the word, No, 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 all the while keeping his head completely still so Kaplan didn't know he was talking to me silently. I got Phil's message. I dropped the subject. I didn't say it. The meeting ended maybe two minutes later with Kaplan saying, keep up the good work and ushering us out by saying, and keep up with the top five things we didn't tell you about today's fifth story. Uh, That's what's making it really cook. When we were out of earshot of Rick Kaplan, Griffin thanked me for being able to read his panicked lips. I used an oath to liven up my question. What the blank was that all about? And Griffin said, Now you know what every day of my life has become. It's not worth it to try to correct him. He believes what he believes, and, and he won't be checked or contradicted. And I said, but we only did the five things we didn't tell you thing once, only once. It's like a year later. How in the hell could he possibly think we're still doing it? Griffin laughed like a soldier on a World War I battlefield who has just run out of bullets. See, that's the problem, buddy. He only watches MSNBC here in the office. The place he's renting, it doesn't have cable president of MSNBC doesn't have cable at home. On June 6, 2006, they fired Rick Kaplan as the president of MSNBC. They let him resign. They also let him keep his secret, the darkest of secrets for him and for MSNBC, that for his two years on the throne, the president of an all-news cable channel did not have cable. done all the damage i can do here thank you for listening here are the credits most of the music was arranged produced and performed by brian ray and john philip chanel who are the countdown musical directors all orchestration and keyboards by john philip chanel guitars bass and drums by brian ray produced by tko brothers other beethoven selections have been arranged and performed by the group no horns allowed the sports music is the olderman theme from espn2 it was written by mitch warren davis courtesy of espn inc Musical comments by Nancy Faust, the best baseball stadium organist ever. Guess what? All the music appeared in today's show. Our announcer today was my friend Jonathan Banks from Breaking Bad. Everything else was pretty much my fault. Remember, not only in this format, Countdown is now also available on YouTube. For those of you who like the animated version of me. That's Countdown for this, the 936th day since Donald Trump's first attempted coup against the democratically elected government of the United States. Arrest him again while we still can. The next scheduled Countdown is tomorrow. It will be our first anniversary episode. Thus ends the first series. Bulletins as the news warrants. Till then, I'm Keith Olbermann. Good morning, good afternoon, good night, and good luck.